When I was a teenager, my favorite swimmer was Ian Thorpe. There's two distinct memories that I've got as a teenager growing up and watching him. The first one is in the 2000 Sydney Olympics in the 4x100 relay, when he had he was the anchor leg and he had the lead off the dive, but very quickly in that first 50, Gary Hall overtakes him. And he comes off the turn, he's about half a body length behind and it looks like there's no way that he can win it from here, he's too far behind. But then over the course of the 50, he, ga- he catches up and at the very last meter or two, he overtakes Gary Hall and takes the win for Australia in front of a home crowd. And even just watching it back when I was looking for this footage, I started to get tingles. It's a very vivid memory from 22 years ago. And that's the first one. The second one is that there was an instructional DVD of how Ian Thorpe swims and how to swim like him. I remember watching that as a teenager and studying his stroke, what he used to do and what could I take on board with my own swimming that would make me a faster swimmer. They're two really clear memories that I've got. And in this video, I wanna dig deep into Ian Thorpe's technique break it down with some footage that we've got and see what he does really well. Now he's obviously quite tall, he's got big hands, big feet, and has one of the longest strokes that you will see. This footage is from the Swim Fast YouTube channel. I'll put a link below. They've got some great footage of, old, older footage of uh, some swimmers with good drills and stuff like that. So go and check them out below. This is some training footage of Ian Thorpe and I really like to, to watch this through because you get to see some different angles that you wouldn't see when they're when he's racing. So we can take a look at his stroke in a bit more detail. One of the more unique things about Ian Thorpe was his head position. He had a tendency to look a long way forwards compared to where you'd see most elite swimmers. After he takes his breath, he brings his head back down to that zero to 45 degree range that I'd I'd normally teach. But then just before he does take a breath, he looks a fair way forwards. As you can see there, he's looking above that 45 degree range just before he turns to breathe. Now, it's not something that I'd necessarily teach to many swimmers because when I'm running clinics here in Australia, one of the things that often comes up is people are lifting too much before they turn and you do see their hips and legs drop too much as a result. So a little bit of a look you know, look forwards is okay, but too much and it does impact the body position and some other things as well. So take this with a grain of salt. I heard that he used to look forwards to help put his feet a bit deeper in the water so he could make more from his kick because he had very long feet and a really strong kick. So maybe that's the case, but I'm just, I'm not exactly sure if that's true or not. So that's his, his head position, which was quite unique. Now he had one of the longest strokes in, in history, basically, uh, of, with freestyle swimming. And he looked as though he was rotating a really long way on his side, each and every stroke. But the good thing about this footage here is you can see that the actual furthest point of rotation for him is about here. And if we measure that angle through the shoulders, you'll see that he's rotating to about 34 degrees through his shoulders. And it's similar on his breathing stroke as well. So if you slow it down, you look at it from the front, 30 to 40 degrees is where you see the best swimmers in the world rotating to it at its furthest point through their their shoulders. So don't think that you need to get to, to 90 degrees. It's just too far. And it puts too much strain on your rotator cuff as you go through your catch, which is this motion here. So just think of that as like you're rocking side to side, like what Carlin Pipes talks about there, rocking side to side, not rolling side to side. The other way that I think is really helpful here with your rotation is think of rotating forwards. So as you're reaching forwards out the front here, you're sending that rotation out in front of you in this direction rather than downwards because if you're thinking of rotating to the side sometimes that causes you to lean too much on the side and lose some balance and go further than what's required so i like the thought of rotating forwards because you naturally get some rotation anyway as a result of it but you're unlikely to go too far which is a really common thing if we have a look at his his kick he's got a terrific kick and very obviously flexible ankles as you can see here on some of these downward kicks Right, have a look at that that range through the through the ankles, hypermobile through there. All right, he's actually going sort of 
really pointing the toes past that that 180 mark there. So very flexible with the ankles. And his kick is from the hip. There's that saying you want to kick from the hip instead of the knees. But the way I think of that, and again, when I'm running clinics, something that a lot of people tend to do is they're kicking from the knees where it's just this big like bend of the knees and there's no undulation, this sort of wave-like motion with their kick. So when you look at someone's kick, and we'll see, here we go, we want to we want to see it's almost like your leg is this ribbon that's in the wind where we've got this this nice undulation through the through the kick rather than just this this harsh down kick only without the up kick as well. So that's what we want to aim for with the with the kick as well as having the heels break the break the surface. Now another thing that he that he did incredibly well was he'd enter in a in a good spot out in front here where it's it's a decent distance out in front of his head. And sometimes people wonder, where should I be entering? If your other arm is, is out in front, let's say it's uh, let's say it's here, for example, anywhere from about your elbow to your knuckles is where you'd want your hand coming in at. So out in front there, that's where we should be entering. And you'll see for, for Thorpe, it's, it's probably around about the wrist is roughly where he's, he's entering there. Now, if you have a look at the, the left one here, enters forward. Uh, reaches forwards. It's like a plane going into land there. And then he gets to the starting catch, catch position pretty quickly of fingers blow wrist, wrist blow elbow to start the, the catch there. And that's where we want to get to when we finish reaching forwards. Often people will either come in and be up here too high or they'll come in and they'll, they'll just go down too deep. They're not actually reaching forwards. But this is a really good position to get to to start your catch. Now, as we go to... This shot here, you'll see with his with his catch that he's got a pretty extreme catch position that most people I work with who are triathletes and open water swimmers, uh, without that kind of range for their shoulders, it's not something that I'd be I'd be looking to get to. But for those that can, you know, that's it's such a such an impressive catch. So at the end of the catch, if we're looking you know, roughly front on here, and we look at the angle of the arm, you'll see that his arm is around about. So 105 degrees in the catch. So if we're looking front on, we want to see an angle of 100 to 120 degrees with that with that angle. If you're a sprinter, sometimes it's a little bit more, like 130 at the end of the catch. But that's the, the right angle for a good high elbow position when we're looking front on. And he gets it on the, the left arm, and he also gets it on the, the right arm through here. Really, really impressive position. Now... The, in order to get to that position with the high elbow catch, sometimes people think, well, I need to have my shoulder on my cheek up here or on my ear. But the thing with that is it's, it compromises the strength that you can have through that position. So what I would normally teach here is where you want to have your shoulder is near your cheek, not on it, but just near it. That will help you set up a good catch and allow you to get there without compromising the, the strength or the power that you'd have. And again, you'll see it here with Ian. Okay, have a look at that. Shoulder is sort of right near the, the cheek. It's not touching it. It's not covering his ear. It's just near the cheek. And that is part of what can allow you to get a really good catch through that part of the, of the stroke there. All right, let's bring it back a little bit. Now, after that, so we've looked at the start of the catch here where he gets fingers below wrist, wrist below elbow. Then the second part is the is the high elbow position, which we've looked at there. Now the third thing, and, and this is something that, that we teach as part of our clinics, is the power diamond. And we came up with this term, term a couple of years ago after I spoke with some coaches and um, they were talking about what this diamond shape. And when we did some testing with the EO Swim Better, we looked at where the, the peak of the power is for people is, is around about here in this position. So the power diamond is when your hand's passing underneath your shoulder, your arm should make this half diamond shape where the elbow's pointing to the side, the fingers are pointing down, and if we had both arms there, that looks like a diamond. That's where you see really good swimmers as their hands are passing under the shoulder because that's a similar shape, that's a similar position to where you'd be if you were pulling yourself out of the water if you're on the side of the pool. You'd have the elbows out, hands somewhat close to the body. Not too close, but out here. And Thorpe gets that incredibly well through this part of the stroke here. 
and he's even you know he's even probably closer than I've seen nearly you know nearly all the swimmers that I've I've analyzed through there because he does come pretty close to his to his body and to his hip after that power diamond so from here he comes in finishes pretty close to the center pretty close to the hip and he's just he's just very very close there again close than what I see with a lot of a lot of other swimmers but I mean he's got he's got great power from the kick He's got a lot of strength through that through that movement, and so he's just able to maintain that position through there because it does take a reasonable amount of strength to come in and, and finish through there. So it's just uh, you know it's quite it's a little bit different than what I've seen with with other swimmers. But again, you want to go to that technique. You want to use the technique that's suitable for you with your body type, the way that you swim, what you naturally gravitate to, and and for him, you know, this was obviously um, obviously really effective. One of the other things that that really sort of stood out to me is his is his breath timing. Now, if you get your breath at the right time in the stroke, then you can be very effective with your catch on the side that you're breathing, which for most people is actually their you know, their weaker side. So when we want to time the breath, is you should pull into the breath, meaning that as your hand is passing underneath your shoulder, which you'll see here, all right that's when you should start to turn the head. And he begins to turn his head you know, just a bit before that, starts to turn the head here. His face is out of the water now, just before his hand's about to exit the water. And then he brings his eyes back down right now, just at the end of the catch right there. So by the time he's about to begin moving from the, the end of the catch to the power diamond, his head's already down. And that just means that he's, he can really get a, re a good catch and connect it with his rotation. So you'll see his opposite hip coming down as he's pulling through here. He's really driving that together. Now you don't need to be that early. That's earlier than where I see a lot of other elite swimmers, but with him, he's got a, he's got a long stroke, good distance per stroke. He, uh, he spends a bit of time out there in the, in the reach, longer than what some other swimmers would do. So it gives him time to bring the head back down. So it doesn't have to be that early but we do want to at least get the eyes back down in the water at the latest by the time you're in the power diamond. So at the latest, you'd want the eyes back down about, about now. That's where we see you know, those really good, really good swimmers. Have a look at his breathing here as well. So once he does get his, his breath, right, you'll see he brings the face back down in the water. Now we get a little bit of air leaving through his nose little bit of air coming through the nose there. Then just as he turns, that's where you get the big exhale. You wanna just sort of bring it in, little trickle of air through the nose, and then as you're going to breathe in again, clear the lungs on that as you turn to the side there. And when you do it, when you breathe out through the nose, you can be much more controlled with your breathing. And it's okay if some comes out through the mouth, but if you can, try and just keep most of it through the nose. It's what you do see at the, at the elite end.